5. Real Life Murders Caused by Television Shows Television shows are part of pop culture. Some are controversial, others trashy, others worthy. But some shows can trigger different effects in people. And the five cases on this list are instances where it brought out the very worst sides of the people on the small screen. These are five real life murders caused by television shows. Number five, The Jerry Springer Show, Ralph Pinitz. On July 24, 2000, The Jerry Springer Show broadcasted another one of its sometimes controversial episodes. It had been recorded three months prior and was titled Secret Mistresses Confronted. On the show were Sarasota, Florida residents Ralph and Eleanor Penance. The couple invited Nancy Campbell Penance, Ralph's ex-wife, and accused her of stalking them and making their lives as difficult as possible. Nancy agreed to be a guest thinking Ralph was going to make up with her, but as Nancy was brought on stage she was greeted with boos and chants. The usual exchange of questions, shouting, and pointing fingers then began. As the show rolled on, the revelation started. It turns out even after divorcing and Ralph starting a relationship with Eleanor, he continued to sleep with both women without either of them knowing. Even more strange was on the eve of the show's taping, all three stayed in a Chicago hotel and Ralph slept with Nancy. In the end, Nancy walked off the show to the taunts and jeers of the live audience. She was angry and just hours after the show aired, a judge issued her a restraining order against Ralph. He wasn't allowed near her or her home. A few weeks later, and upset from being barred, Ralph, Eleanor, and Ralph's nephew, Marcus, drank in a bar as they watched the broadcast of the show they were on. All three then drove to Nancy's home to collect the couple's remaining items. It's believed that while there, they all started arguing again. At some point, Ralph panicked and fled through the back door. Eleanor and Marcus left in their own cars and Eleanor said that when she came back, she found her husband in a daze. She picked him up and they left the property. Marcus then knocked on the door but found it barricaded and he called police fearing the worst. Once police got inside, they found Nancy dead. She had been beaten and then strangled to death. Police believe she was even killed while the show was still airing. Ralph and Eleanor fled the state but were later arrested. According to Ralph, he was so drunk on the day Nancy was killed, he couldn't remember anything that happened. As repercussion, a lawsuit was filed against the Jerry Springer show stating that they encouraged Ralph to lie in order to force Nancy to appear on the program. However, representatives from the show argue other incidents had happened contributing to the tragedy and the show or its host shouldn't be held responsible. Ralph Penance is currently serving life in prison for the crime. Eleanor still maintains she's innocent of doing anything. Number 4. The Voice, Kevin Loibel YouTube sensation and The Voice contestant Christina Grimmie had just finished an amazing performance at the Plaza Live, a popular venue in Orlando, Florida on June 11, 2016. The beautiful 22-year-old excitedly joined her brother Mark at their merchandise booth for her favorite part meeting the fans. Right at the end of the line was a young man in a flannel shirt and a baseball cap. When he approached the singer, she could tell he was shy. She stood up, greeted him by opening her arms to give him a hug, her way of breaking the ice whenever she sensed that a fan was shy. But instead of giving her a nice hug back, the man pulled out a gun and shot her once, then he fired three more times at point-blank range. Seeing his sister fall to the ground, Mark rushed at the man and tackled him. The two scuffled as those in the area ran for the exits. The man was able to pull himself away from Mark's grip. He then backed up against a wall, pulled out a second gun, aimed it on the side of his head and pulled the trigger. Christina was still breathing and was rushed to the hospital, but hours later she succumbed to her wounds. As people sought answers, they turned to the identity of the gunman. Police discovered he was 27-year-old Kevin Lobel. A natural introvert, Kevin's home life wasn't ideal. He grew up in a semi-abusive home. When his mother died from a drug overdose, he moved in with his dad and girlfriend and worked at Best Buy where he was assigned to the Geek Squad because he was so bad with interacting with people. 
Then in 2015, Kevin saw Christina sing on YouTube, and that's when his obsession began. In his plan to make her fall in love with him, he decided to change himself. So Kevin lost 50 pounds, got LASIK surgery, whitened his teeth, and even got implants to cover his receding hairline. Even more, he seems to have also taken an interest in Christina's Christian beliefs. But Kevin's close friend, Corey Dennington, noticed the admiration was turning into an unhealthy obsession. Dennington told their boss about it, but since Kevin wasn't showing anything unusual at work, there was nothing they could do. Weeks before the show, Kevin bought tickets and purchased two guns. When he got home, he packed a drawstring pack with his guns, a 5-inch hunting knife, and three boxes of bullets. He took his hard drive from his computer and hid it. Then he traveled to Orlando, checked into a hotel, and the following day prepared to head to the concert. For a long time after the singer was shot, people wondered why Kevin did it. When police investigated the gunman's computer and cell phone records, they concluded Christina was likely killed for her outspoken Christian beliefs. Although it was hard to pinpoint if this was the reason, police could tell Kevin had intense hatred for Christians, singling out one particular female Christian singer, according to one of his many rantings. Number 3. My Sister Sam, Robert Bardo It was July 18, 1989, Actress Rebecca Schaefer was in her West Hollywood home waiting urgently for a mail courier who was supposed to deliver a very important script to the actress. She had a big audition coming up. It was a chance to play Mary Corleone in Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather Part 3. When the doorbell rang, the young actress excitedly headed for the door, but to her surprise, it wasn't the delivery man with the script. Instead, it was a man who showed her a letter and an autograph she had once sent him. It was a short conversation and she told him not to come back to her home again. So without incident, the man left, headed to a nearby diner and then ate breakfast. But an hour later, he returned to Rebecca's apartment. He rang the doorbell again. The actress opened the door and this time told him he was wasting her time. From out of nowhere, he pulled out a gun and fired two shots. Neighbors heard the gunfire and Rebecca's frantic screams. Neighbors found the actress slumped on the floor. Other people saw a man in a yellow shirt running on the Hollywood block before disappearing into an alley. The following day, motorists reported a man running on Interstate 10. Police came and arrested him, and he immediately confessed that he had killed Rebecca Schaefer. Robert Bardo was his name. He was the youngest out of seven children. Born in Tucson, Arizona, he suffered severe mental and physical abuse as a child and his teachers described him as a time bomb on the verge of exploding. His first obsessive affection was given to Samantha Smith, the child that had become famous for sending a letter to Mikhail Gorbachev. Then at 16, he became a fan of the TV sitcom My Sister Sam, starring none other than Rebecca Schaefer. To show his obsession, he built a shrine of the actress in his bedroom. He also sent many letters to her, one of which the actress replied to thanking him and signing it with love from Rebecca. But later on, Bardo saw the film Class Struggle, where Rebecca had a sex scene with a male actor. This upset Bardo, and he accused the actress of becoming one more of the bitches in Hollywood. That's when he decided he needed to punish her. He first tried to obtain a gun, but was turned down when he indicated he had prior mental health issues but the next day he returned and had his brother buy the gun for him instead. By July of 89, he had paid a private investigator $250 to get Schaefer's address for him. Rebecca was rushed to the hospital where she succumbed to her injuries. Bardo was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As a result of this case, the anti-stalking laws were then put into effect. Number two, to catch a predator. Luis Conrad Jr. Appealing to the masses' desire for crime and drama, To Catch a Predator was a recurring series on Dateline NBC. The show, hosted by Chris Hansen, was bent on trapping and luring potential sexual predators, those who would engage in underage sex or attempt to entice a minor. It was November 2006 when Perverted Justice, 
an independent group used as consultants for the show, announced another sting operation was conducted with the help of law enforcement in Murphy, Texas. One of those under investigation was Assistant District Attorney Lewis Conrad Jr. For two weeks, perverted justice workers posed online as a 13-year-old fictional kid named Luke. They alleged that on the other end of the chat line was Conrad posing as a 19-year-old college student named Will. The two exchanged sexually charged online chats with one another. At one point, Will even asked Luke for a nude picture of himself. When the sting operation was to take place, the show brought in an adult actor to play the character of Luke. Will and Luke exchanged phone calls, but when Luke asked if he would come over to a rented house where the police and cameras had been set up, Will refused and stopped responding. So that's when the group decided to bring the operation into Conrad's home. Police and SWAT team were all in place, with at least one cameraman hidden close to Conrad's residence. The warrant was sent out at around 2 p.m., but the crew and everyone else was already at the residence vicinity hours before, as several neighbors had reported suspicious-looking people. When the group noticed that the Sunday newspaper was missing, they figured Conrad must be inside the home. Based on this, police decided to do a tactical SWAT entry, as it seems Conrad was aware of their presence and might be destroying evidence while they waited. The police broke down the door and swept through the home, they came across Conrad in the hallway, and he shouted, I'm not going to hurt anyone. Then he fired a single shot to his head, using a Browning 380 handgun, killing himself instantly. Criticism came shortly after, and many blamed Hansen and perverted justice for influencing the police's decisions. But the showrunners point out Conrad's guilt for soliciting a minor was his reason for committing suicide. They also encouraged everyone to read through the chat logs, and verification call recordings to truly know what Conrad was like. In the end, Conrad's sister filed a $105 million lawsuit against NBC Universal. The two parties eventually settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. Number 1. The Jenny Jones Show, Jonathan Schmitz It was March 6, 1995 when Scott Eminder came in to tape an episode for The Jenny Jones Show. The show is known for its controversial topics, and for this episode, they titled it Same Sex Secret Crushes, although none of the guests were told this prior to going on stage. Scott walked in, was interviewed, and Jones, the show host, encouraged him to share his sexual fantasies about his crush. Then Jonathan Schmitz was brought on stage. Schmitz had no clue who his secret admirer was, but he was curious enough to attend the show. He later said the producers hinted it was a woman, and he thought it was someone he worked with that he also liked as well. Once Schmitz came out, the two men, who were friends, shared a quick, awkward embrace. Then the host dropped her bombshell, that Scott was actually Schmitz's admirer. In response, Schmitz gave out a nervous laugh, then said he was completely heterosexual. He also told Scott and Donna Riley, a common friend between the two, you lied to me. Three days after the show was taped, Schmitz found a sexually suggestive note at his house. Soon after that, he left his home and went to the bank. He withdrew money and bought a shotgun. After that, he headed to Scott's mobile home and asked him about the note. It seems the conversation ended in an argument Schmitz then went outside, headed back to his car, and retrieved the shotgun before going back to the trailer. There, he shot Scott twice in the chest, killing him instantly. After, Schmitz then left, called 911, and confessed to the killing. He was arrested and found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 20 to 25 years in prison. During his appeal, his sentence was overturned, but the retrial found him guilty as well. Scott's family sued The Jenny Jones Show in 1999, stating that their ambush tactic and negligent role caused the death of Scott. Although the family initially won the case, it was later overturned by an appeals court. That episode never aired as a result of the tragedy, and The Jenny Jones Show was canceled shortly after as a direct result. So there were five real-life murders caused by television shows. TV shows are meant for entertainment, but as producers aim to push the envelope in order to maintain viewers, 
Sometimes the result goes way beyond anything anyone expects. And, as these cases show, unfortunately, it can cause people to do unspeakable acts for a variety of different reasons. If you enjoyed watching this, then please subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday for you to check out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.